like to uh, begin uh, by thanking uh, the doctor. Thank you very much. And by acknowledging that we're on unceded Algonquin territory. Uh, my name is Jesse Thistle. I am a Métis Cree from northern Saskatchewan. Uh, Eleven years ago, I was that homeless uh, addict dealing with some serious mental health challenges. I was addicted to crack cocaine and paid regular visits to correctional facilities across Ontario. I couldn't read or write at a literate level. I had no high school education, and I couldn't walk on my own, consequent of a serious injury and a staph infection that almost took my leg and my life. I was that limping homeless person that many in society would avoid if they saw me approach on the street looking for change or help or just some conversation. Today, however, I can read and write and walk just fine. In fact, I'm a Trudeau Vanier scholar, a Governor General medalist, and the resident scholar of Indigenous homelessness at the Canadian Observatory on Homelessness. And I'm one of the most decorated PhD students in the country. So how did that happen, you ask? How did I make the giant leap from there to here? Well, in a nutshell, I used the jail system, rehab, and school as pathways off the streets. I used them as a way to reconnect myself back into the interconnected web of all my relations. Jail saved my life and allowed me to keep my leg. Rehab got me sober and gave me back my heart. And education helped me figure out why I was out of control and why my Indigenous family was so broken. School also showed me why my dad was murdered in 1982, why my parents abandoned me and my brothers in 1980, and why my grandparents, Searle and Jackie Thistle, were the only real love I'd known until I met my wife in 2009. That deep understanding helped me forgive some of the past. But admittedly, I'm still working on it. You see, I'm not only a survivor of Canadian street life, I'm a survivor of Canadian colonization. And my decade on and off the streets was a result of intergenerational trauma, a, for, uh, a form of PTSD that is passed down through the generations, which destroyed my nuclear family by the time I was three years old. The destruction of my family made me resentful growing up, which negatively impacted my choices and eventually led to my addictions and homelessness. In adulthood, intergenerational trauma, for those who don't know, expresses itself in things like addictions, sexual and physical abuse, misogyny, mental health challenges, criminality, transience, and homelessness, which appear more frequently in Indigenous families than in the general population of Canada. My family was no exception. In this regard, I am not unique as thousands upon thousands of indigenous homeless people across the country are just like me, resistors of colonial trauma, whose homes have been devastated by land displacements, projects of forced assimilation, linguicide, domicide, genocide, residential schools, structural violence, racism, marginalization, and a general ignorance from settlers towards indigenous realities. Essentially, the making of this country has made whole communities of Indigenous people homeless. And that is what we are seeing in our shelter systems and streets today. But before I get into that, perhaps I should let you know who I am so you know where I'm coming from. My mother is Blanche Morissette from Big River, Saskatchewan. Her people are the rebel Métis Cree who fought against Canada during the 1885 Northwest Resistance. Canada crushed our freedom fight by sending an army of thousands of well-armed soldiers and Northwest Mounted Police to fight against hundreds of ill-equipped Métis families, grandmothers and grandfathers, sisters and brothers, wives and husbands and sons and daughters who died at Batash, defending our homes and our livelihoods. After the resistance, the government stole our lands, denied us any rights, and banished us to absolute poverty for over a century. Traumatized, we came to squat on Crown land on the sides of the roads and the railways, 
Thus, we became known as the Road Allowance Michif. We couldn't borrow money. We couldn't practice co-op agriculture. We couldn't participate in the free market. We couldn't get jobs. And we didn't even have any treaty support or formal education of any kind. This was our punishment for challenging Canadian imperial designs. And for Prime Minister Sir John A. Macdonald's personal grudge against Riel for embarrassing him during the 1869 Red River resistance, for which John A. was prematurely forced to create the province of Manitoba as a Métis homeland. Macdonald never kept his promise to us Métis, though, and instead gave away our land to settlers the minute the ink was dry. My mother's people have been essentially homeless ever since. My father, on the other hand, was Sonny Searle Thistle. His people are the Algonquin of Northern Ontario and the Highland Scots of Cape Breton Island, Nova Scotia. My father's maternal grandfather was Algonquin David Mackenzie, born in Notre Dame de Nord, Quebec. Grandpa David was stolen from his people at age seven and incarcerated at Indian Residential School in Spanish Ontario in 1915. At Spanish, he suffered sexual, physical, and emotional abuse, which would torment him his whole life. David's daughter, my grandmother Jackie, had it rough living under his roof. And as a result, she didn't learn good parenting skills from her father or what it meant to be Algonquin. Algonquin, to Grandma Jackie, meant the pain and neglect of her damaged father, something she learned to run from by the 1950s. Grandpa Searle Thistle, my father's father, was a Cape Bretoner. His ancestors were the Gaelic Scots who were displaced from their highland homes to make room for industrial sheep herding. This violent period in 19th century British imperial history is called the Highland Clearances. The English overlords simply rounded up the Scottish Gales, stuck them on boats, and then shipped them off to Cape Britain, and then forgot about them. Canada continued this tradition. Many starved to death in the new environment. As such, Grandpa Searle's line suffered a severe economic neglect over 150 years, a, ne a neglect that eventually killed my great-grandfather Samuel, who was worked to death in the Sydney coal mines in 1938. Thus, Grandpa Th uh, Thistle grew up without his father, and he too wasn't equipped to raise children, just like Grandma Jackie. When my grandparents married and had my dad in the early 1950s, the odds were stacked against them. The transgenerational trauma they'd both inherited from their ancestors combined to alienate my teenage father by the late 1960s, which in turn led to his experimentation with drugs, then hardcore addictions, high-risk lifestyle, and eventual murder in 1982. But I didn't know any of this history growing up or what intergenerational trauma was. All I knew was that my mom and my dad weren't around and that my grandparents in Toronto had to adopt me and my two brothers after dad robbed some stores and disappeared after skipping parole in 1982. The last known sighting of my dad was outside my Aunt Sherry's place in December of that year. He got into a car with some people, drove off, and then vanished into thin air. My dad was an outlaw, and the police now believe he most likely met the fate of someone who lived that kind of lifestyle. To explain my dad's disappearance, my grandparents always told us that he'd lost his mind on drugs and was homeless somewhere. But the truth was that they didn't know what happened to him or where he was. No one did. <laughs> 